Addresses concerns that have been expressed, um, or we submit more emphasis because we submit the virus of that, but they've been expressed um, for months and years actually of some of the perceived fire dangers uh, in our greenhouse and parks and areas where people are uh, camping and uh, not supposed to. So this ordinance um, is, I guess, out there, but this isn't perfect, and we do expect some changes to come. So we're going to run through those, some of the legal framework and concerns and developing this ordinance and then how this ordinance is intended to work. And so uh, my new Trump State Edmondson is going to walk us through this. All right. Um, and Sadie, if you could use your projecting voice, we're trying to get a microphone. So okay. if you could just speak as loud as you can so that uh, all the people participating can hear. All right, so uh, as it says, it's due process guidelines for abatement of campsites, fire implements, and heating devices in wildfire danger areas. Um, to start off, just a little discussion points outline. We're going to show some examples of some fires that have happened on public land within the Anchorage municipality this summer. Uh, just give a little um, overview of what due process is, the current language we have for wildfire danger areas. Uh, the types of notice that we have underneath this ordinance, some definitions for reckless use, and then uh, some explanation for the opportunity for hearing. So to start off, um, this happened uh, July 2nd. Uh, this was the MLK and Elmore fire. Um, this is, I mean, just some pictures that we got from the news about the, uh, just the extent of the smoke that you can see. Um, here's some more pictures of that. The red area shows the extent of the um, fire. Um, our next fire is uh, the Carlock and 20th fire that happened on June 14th. This one specifically, we have the fire report and it stated the actual cause for the fire was started by a cooking fire. Uh, this report is from the Division of Forest from the State of Alaska Office. They were responsible for this investigation, so I respond. So, uh, for here, we're going to have a little uh, just overview of what due process is. So, it is a constitutional safeguard against the deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process of law by requiring a government to give a person notice, the opportunity to be heard, and a fair judicial determination. This is a very strict constitutional guideline, so we really had to be careful to follow these law, like these rules when we were making this uh, ordinance just because it is very, very strict to make sure we don't breach anyone's constitutional rights. Um, I also have a, 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 some, part, some language from a uh, Alaska Supreme Court case that talks about void for vagueness, which is just another part of the due process law. Um, this specifically says that a law may be void for vagueness if its language fails to give adequate notice of the conduct that is prohibited or if its imprecise language encourages arbitrary enforcement by allowing prosecuting authorities undue discretion to determine the scope of its prohibits. So really this is just saying that um, you really had to be very careful about this language and make sure that anyone that was going to be taking any fire implements or campsites uh, under this had very, very strict guidelines for how that was going to happen to make sure that, again, they did not breach anyone's constitutional rights. So this next part is about a uh, wildfire danger area. Um, so this is what the language that we have in the current ordinance that was introduced this past <coughs> assembly meeting. Um, something to say about this, this language is probably going to change in the S version. We're going to make it a little bit 
uh, stricter just to make sure that the wildfire danger area cannot be over the entire, um, so just basically you can't make the wildfire danger area the entire municipality. Because this is very, very specific parts of public land that um, is very dangerous. Like this, because the main purpose for this is to protect people's safety, right? And we can't make a wildfire danger area the entire municipality. Um, so our next part is a 24 hour abatement notice. So there are a few different sections for this ordinance. Um, one part was really just adding to our already existing campsite abatement laws. Uh, so this is for specifically when there are prohibited campsites with the presence of fire implements in already designated wildfire danger areas during a burn ban. So the notice that is going to be placed is going to be the same as the 10 day zone abatement notices that we've already been using. Um, our S version that's coming up might have a slightly different notice uh, requirements, but it's going to be basically the same. You still have to give verbal notice to any people within the wildfire danger area that their stuff is going to be abated. The notice has to contain the approximate location of the campsite <coughs> and the wildfire danger area so everyone knows the precise limits where this is going to apply. Uh, has to have the code provision, has to say that the campsites are going to re be removed in 24 <coughs> hours. It has to tell you where the personal property is going to be taken, how to reclaim it, and how to file any appeals. Uh, again, just so everyone has exact notice for what's going on in these cases. So the uh, this next one is for immediate removal of campsites. So this is only when there are certain circumstances where it is extremely dangerous for people to be using fire implements in wildfire danger areas. So these are when there is uh, an active wildfire in the vicinity or if there is a wildfire danger area that is closed for public use entirely. So in this case, if items are stored or secured by the municipality, the municipality must provide notice in person or in that location where the campsite was taken um, that the items have been taken and then instructions for uh, retrieval and how to request a post deprivation hearing. Oh, if I may, this relates to language that's shown in the ordinance on page five, there are the exceptions for the exceptions circumstances exception. That exception's already there, this just adds to the language to emphasize that these are clients that are immediately in Right. And then there is another type of uh, immediate removal, and that is just for fire implements and heating devices. Uh, so this is the really the big new section that we added um, to the code through this ordinance. Well, that will be added hopefully to the code through this ordinance. Uh, it's on page six if you would like to look at it through the ordinance. Um, so this is talking about how fire implements and heating devices can be immediately removed from wildfire danger areas when there are circumstances that pose a wildfire hazard or reckless to human life and safety. So this is when, uh, so we have these, these extended circumstances listed in the ordinance as well, but so this is when there's a use of fire implements or heating devices during a burn ban on public property not designated for such use. The use of fire implements or heating devices in a reckless manner demonstrating gross disregard for fire danger uh, we are going to be talking a little bit more about that language specifically right after this, just so everyone knows exactly <coughs> what that means. And then also when there are specific circumstances that indicate that people that are using these uh, implements and devices do not intend to cease and desist from such use. So this type of notice is going to be just the same as immediate removal of campsites where the notice has to be given to people uh, or posted at the location and talks about the instructions and locations for retrieval of these items, and then how to request a post deprivation hearing. All right, so uh, for reckless use, the main standard for this <coughs> is that there must be sufficient circumstances for any rational prior of fact to find there had been reckless use in a manner demonstrating gross disregard for imminent fire danger. 
So reckless use, as it's defined uh, by the Alaska legislature in Alaska statutes, um, says that reckless using something recklessly is with respect to results or to a circumstance described by the provisions of law defining an offense where the person is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur and that the circumstance exists. So things like this, it also talks about the fact that if you are intoxicated and still acting recklessly with respect to that risk, that is not a defense. Like recklessly, has to, is, it's, it's a different standard than certain standards like negligent or just straight use. So you have to be really considering these circumstances and using it recklessly um, in the awareness of, of what you're doing. Um, so another part of this is gross disregard, which in uh, through the Black's Law, which is the legal definition dictionary, says that gross disregard is beyond all reasonable measure, an imminent danger as an immediate real threat to one's safety. So these are just the definitions for that you know, any municipality officer that is going to be taking these implements will have to use when they're looking at these circumstances before they can immediately take someone's fire implements or heating device. Uh, so we have an example of some of these factors that they will be looking at as well for the reckless use. So there's a lot of examples here. There's things like if there's a local drought in the area, the fire danger rating level, if there's rubbish or waste being used as fuel for fire, if they're up to the size of the open flames or fire, uh, if there's exposed or defective wires on any of these devices, if there's dangerous accumulations of rubbish or waste paper or boxes, other flammable materials nearby, uh, if it's unattended, if there's leaking or defective batteries. <coughs> so there's just a lot of different factors that they have to look at um, when they're deciding if there's been a reckless use. And not all of these will necessarily immediately trigger uh, immediate removal. They will have to look at the entire circumstance, not just a single uh, factor. Uh, so this last slide is talking about the opportunity for hearing. So generally with due process, uh, you have to have a pre-deprivation <coughs> hearing because it's important that if you are taking someone's property that they have, I mean it has to be legal, right? But there are very specific circumstances where a post-deprivation hearing can be used. Um, Usually, very strongly for this case as well, that there is, if there is a delay in taking these materials, it could result in devastation of parkland, destruction of property, and result in serious injury or death, which is the reason that uh, post deprivation is really important here because, I mean, again, we really cannot delay because just like the examples we saw earlier, it can result in some pretty devastating uh, just destruction. Um, and so, I mean, the main thing with this as well is the post deprivation process has to be pretty quick. So if, in this case, their items have already been taken, so if they are requesting a hearing, it has to be very fast so that they can get any justification or any re remedy for uh, what has happened to them. So that is it. Is there any questions from the assembly members? Yes. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, that was a very good presentation. So I have uh, one quick question. I have a other question. Thank you. So the, the first question is, you were describing the, um, the definition for re reckless use, and we're using the Alaska statutory definition. Is there a reason that we shouldn't insert that into the definition section? I don't know if it's for you or Mr. Gates. Um, I, I, well, he's, you know, busy cleaning up right now, so I'll kind of answer this as best as I can. I don't necessarily think that there is a reason for us to define it if it's already been defined by the uh, state statutes, just because, I mean, that definition is already very much in um, a statute, sorry. Uh, but I don't necessarily think it would hurt to put your own definition in there. Right, I mean, just but, me. We don't have to follow the state statute True. for those kind of definitions, and that's clearly what we're doing. So I think that perhaps we should insert that language uh, into the definition section because a significant portion of the ordinance turns on it. 
Um, the, the other question, the broader one for you and for Ms. Wynn Pearson. Uh, so we got pretty far down the road, I believe it was last summer, it might have been something before, I think it was last summer, on an ordinance to do something similar to this, that is to, to ban, I think we mostly focused on propane tanks, but can one of you describe the differences between that, uh, that prior ordinance and this ordinance, and sort of why, I'm trying to recall, and I can't recall why exactly we stopped pursuing that previous ordinance. I know when we passed zone base abatement, we had a pilot project with storage. We were doing a lot of things last summer. But you, can you describe sort of why that ordinance failed and how and why this one is uh, is different, or how this one is different? Um. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, first of all, I did describe the difference. So the prior ordinance session which you did address the propane tanks and fire fumes, and it was uh, looking at amending um, a different section since Hub 25 related to municipal land and parks and prohibited conduct on uh, municipal land and municipal parks and saying that um, how we propane tanks and fire there was dangerous and that it would authorize seizure of tanks and fire fuels. Uh, so that ordinance also, it did not uh, address the private campsites themselves. It was um, more focused just on the um, uh, fire danger presented by certain items that might be in campsites, just be a part of something using the recreational fire, for example. Um, so this ordinance is different because, uh, well, it amends different sections of code. It treats it instead as a public nuisance. So instead of uh, the prior ordinance with seizing propane tanks, treating that as though some civil violation, we get a fine and seizure of the items. This instead is uh, approaching the problem as removing the danger of abatement of the hazard for causing fire in, in, in public land. It also adds the additional component of addressing prohibited camps in areas where wildfire danger is especially high and the risks are very high. So mostly this takes the approach of we're taking things away for safety, being for the public health, for safety and welfare to abate and mitigate um, public nuisance dangers. So, um, the prior ordinance, we uh, had some discussions with the fire chief of the APT, uh, <coughs> the department, and several others in the administration. And generally, and I think also in researching this, I saw that seizure of propane tanks is something that no other jurisdiction has done. No other jurisdiction that I can find has uh, submitted a law that's focused on seizing propane tanks and the fire tools. What they are focused on is mitigating fire hazards. Um, the fire chief also said, well, propane tanks themselves are not inherently dangerous. You know, you've got federal regulation that uh, requires how propane tanks are designed, the valves, and all that. So if they're just sitting there, they're not dangerous. Maybe they have a pile of them, they're all dangerous in and in of themselves. What is dangerous is how they're used. People use them improperly when it's a fire. So it's the fire that's the danger. So this ordinance uses the term fire implements. Um, and authorizes officials, the police, to order seizure of those fire implements, things that spark, cause the fire or flame, a uh, part of a stove or a uh, mattress or uh, whatever sort of uh, fire implements that was well, under that definition. It was defined rather broadly to allow officials to, well, whatever circumstances they see, can fit this definition. The main thrust is seize the fire implement that would uh, abate that hazard. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Uh, Becky, do you have anything to add? Yeah, if I might add, I think there were also, there were a few practical things that we got kind of wrapped around on last time around. Um, one of those was uh, I was the need to store, that if we were abating on a very short timeline, I think constitutionally we need to store the property, and so that was something that got kind of wrapped around the axle on figuring out. And the other piece was on making sure that the ordinance uh, had some reason to think in between areas where people traditionally do and are allowed to barbecue in public parks. You know, you see the barbecues, pits, and people who use the parks for family barbecues. So my recollection is we got kind of wrapped around mm -hmm. on some of those pieces last time around and then lost some momentum and just didn't move forward with it. Um, I think this ordinance remedies some of those problems, both because of the way in which it defines the implements which would be seized and because of the defined 
uh, fire wildfire danger area portion of the ordinance where it's not a constant need to distinguish between whether you're holding a family barbecue that's not problematic or using a fire implement in a green space in a way that is problematic but where there is this special designation that triggers this uh, this portion um, and if you if you hear from my thoughts on the, the question about the title 11 definition import I think it would be fine to do that that definition is in the criminal statute so it goes we do Im we import it by reference in title 8 because we use the stand the state standards for mens rea in our misdemeanor definitions this is not creating a misdemeanor this is a separate uh, it's just creating a standard for abatement so I think to the extent you want to import or create a definition that is different from the state standard for recklessness in um, any kind of crime that certainly would be uh, good for clarity and I think would be legally permissible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Wellington. Is that working? I think it is working, just okay. to put it close. Okay, so we have a question on So this, does this only apply when there's a municipal burn ban? And if that's the case, how often is that? Um, well, currently the fire uh, chief is authorized to declare this burn ban as palliative. They do that on a daily basis. So if the burn ban is in effect, that's just one of the elements that um, triggers, I guess, authorizations to take some of these actions. So there's several elements here, as Ms. Wood Pearson mentioned, that uh, are different from the problem events as well. We have one um, wildfire danger area. Actually, there's some areas where we have that definition that describes the circumstances that might mean this is more susceptible to a wildfire, smoky, and spreading rapidly. So, uh, that's in those areas. That's one element. The second is a burn down effect, and uh, there is prohibited camping and reckless use of fire. Weapons. Those elements all together within, uh, I guess, the 24 hour of the um, I don't, I don't want to confuse things. There's like four different types of uh, seizures and abatements addressed here. So what is the, uh, let me for some more specifically. Uh, the 24 hours while, uh, uh, 24 hours abatement, you have to have a burn ban, number one. Number two, um, posting the wildfire danger area. You have to have designated wildfire danger areas to post things well, uh, for the notices. Then presence of fire abatements is number three. Um, the baby by 24 hours. So the um, imminent hazard exception we can do immediate abatement rather than 24 hours has the added element of when there's an active wildfire in the city, right? So that's, of course, the uh, more imminent drug issue that we would like to see. And then we have um, a 72 hour notice as well. And this has, I guess, on um, page um, five at the top. It falls into the 72 hour protective band, saying in the wildfire danger area it's protective bands. Now, here the difference between 24 hours is uh, you don't need to have the burn ban in fact. So, the burn ban is in effect, we go to 24 hour abatement, and then we have these other elements as well. All right, thank you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, to put a finer point on uh, what Mr. Gage was saying uh, in response to Mr. Dunbar's question, uh, I was involved with Mr. Croft's original ordinance, and then uh, Ms. LaFrance and I uh, put in a uh, second ordinance, which uh, ended up being melded into this one. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Wood Pearson, uh, he told one of the main reasons why, which was the storage. Uh, the second one, though, um, which I consider the second main reason, uh, was that what we were proposing, what Mr. Croft and I were proposing, what Ms. LaFrance and I were proposing, really didn't add any new tools to what the fire department already has. Um, so the fire department already has the ability to do these things. Um, so thankfully, third uh, time was the charm. The Zealots Hill came in with a different idea, and we were able to combine uh, both our ideas, and uh, now we have a version that I think adds something different um, to the code. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, next we have Ms. Zolotail and then, and then Ms. McDaniel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, it, it, just with what Felix was saying, the difference here really is it's use focus as to the implements. It's not just the existence of them and that it's in a defined area. I, what I would, the intent for me in 
bringing the wildfire danger area, which we're going to work on refining a bit, is so that if there are areas where it's just not safe for people to be, we can get them out. It is really public safety driven um, because we don't want to see anyone um, injured or worse because they're in an area of high fire danger. So I think that's uh, it's been really poignant this summer um, and that we gave some opportunities for varied responses based on the circumstances that are um, enumerated in the ordinance. Um, but ultimately the declaration of the wildfire area as better refined or defined soon um, <coughs> will be left to the subject matter experts you know, of the fire chief or designated. So Mr. Gates, did you have something to add to that before we go on to the next one? Oh, yes, thank you. I wanted to mention storage aspects of uh, one thing that we have done in the um, parts of this ordinance addressing prohibited campsites. The storage is the same as the uh, prohibited campsites. The new section addressing just our incidents, um, I tried to draft this to leave uh, the storage of those viral incidents as broad as possible for the administration to determine. So it's on um, page six. Um, it's probably where you can store or secure in any reasonable manner by the missing them section and make them retrievable by the owner or give them by P on the second day. The intent is it to uh, take them as punishment, take them just for safekeeping, let them be able for retrieval as soon as I guess reasonably possible. So we're talking about that. Of course, the municipality has some obligation to try to either taking it from where it is and making sure that he shows up to retrieve items or the same person they belong to. And some of this logistics takes some time, uh, like just immediate the next day, um, to account for, I guess, implementing the administration. Plus, this leaves it to the administration to determine, well, what resources they have, what is any reason <coughs> Um, I had a question on page five, uh, subsection H three. The our ability to um, remove rebate camps. What ability to do that already exists? I mean, it feels like the municipality, other jurisdictions, specifically the fire department, in an emergency situation. I mean, they draw fire lines. They probably get into people's yards. <coughs> I'm just curious if this is really adding a new ability or if that already is part of its the municipality's power in an emergency? Um, thanks, Ms. Quinn. So you're referring to the bottom of page five, each uh, one we will three use that one. And um, it, in my opinion, and I think Vince but Tony agrees, this doesn't really add anything new. The fire chief already has this, well, there's already this authority in the fire chief. But what this does, I guess, is emphasize and highlight this is something we're very concerned about. Make sure that whoever reads code about what extension circumstances for plants can be removed and includes when there is wild uh, Mr. Hawk Costin. You want me to respond to that? I, I think certainly what I understand you to be proposing is to change the the and basically in the middle of this new restriction to an or, right? So where either there either it's a wildfire danger or where there's a fire in the vicinity. In my opinion, I think that that already meets the standard that's built in here. Exigent circumstances. If it were, if I were to have to make the legal call, the fire chief said there's an active wildfire in the vicinity. Can I, is that some exigent circumstances posing uh, a serious risk to human life? I'd say yes. Already, so I think that the or in the middle of that would, would is I, I think would pass legal muster certainly. Do I think it adds anything to what's in there right now? No, but I think it adds more specificity. And I think it's the other way um, that less than the condition where there is an active wildfire. 
So what is the definition of, a, of that condition? Because right now it's we've got wildfire danger area, which you've created a whole structure for how those are designated. Which is 24 hours. And then you have, oh no, this is saying this is saying you could do one or the other, right? Okay. So you want to, so you're saying, well, you're saying you want to say you could do, or you're saying could we do it immediately if you're a wildfire danger area? Yes, in, in certain conditions. And so that's the question where if, like, say you have an area where people continue to burn and you have that pattern, but you don't want to wait 24 hours because that is a recipe for disaster. Under all the circumstances, ah. the judgment of the fire chief is that this area must be cleared now. And not because there's an active fire, but because the likelihood of an active fire is really high. You know, we had six or seven fires break out around the time of the MLK fire, almost all under the same circumstances, under the same conditions. None of them were in a place where there was a fire, but there were places where there were people. And so the question becomes, can we set up one less, one other standard here where uh, under the determination of chief, I would just basically maybe uh, put it append in the, the word high wildfire danger areas or when, and in that way, there's another one more category. I guess I would say two things, and I also defer, Dean is far more the expert at this point in this area than I am. And I'd say you could, I think you need to give some thought to what that standard is if you wanted to find standards. Again, also, the exigency category says where exigent circumstances posing a serious risk to humans' life and safety exists. So if that standard is met through a, fa a specific fact pattern, the fire chief already can do this. So I think the key would be trying to figure out if you want to create a specific standard, what that standard is. Because I think, as uh, Sadie pointed out in her presentation, the hardest thing that the administration has struggled with in conversation with uh, the sponsors of this ordinance is determining how to define wildfire danger area in a way that doesn't immediately mean the whole municipality is a wildfire danger area, which doesn't seem to be the intent and is also certainly not legally practicable. Right, so I appreciate that. I'll conclude here in just a second. But, um, it seems to me that it's quite reasonable to uh, make a determined base on a number of factors. But what I heard you again just say is that really that power already exists. But it seems like then this amendment right on that line there, line 43, could restrict that ability because it specifically outlines when there are underlines when there is an active wildfire. And there's no, to me, um, difference there once it's, you put that line in. That's possible, and we've had those discussions before. You know, once you say, well, the, if in fire situation, you add something that purports to define what things const constitute exigent circumstances, is that then open to challenge if we say, well, exigent circumstances on the basis of fire danger exist here, too, even though the standard isn't that possible? It's always a challenge I think we face with this ordinance in adding more specific language that conveys assembly intent, uh, but that perhaps doesn't actually change the power provided by the language. So it's a, it's a judgment call. Yeah. If I may. Go ahead. Oh, the fire chief's authority for extended circumstances in closing areas that exists in time 18 of the Alaska statutes. And however we word this, it doesn't change that authority. So they have to do in terms of closing areas and evacuating people and we saw how it happened with the MLK fires. So this language here in 83, I uh, should say, um, the next sentence, the abatement of campsite may proceed. It's, it's discretionary here. We really uh, we really should leave that discussion with the fire chief to make that determination that the, the, the principal element I think is eminent danger and risk of human life and safety. And adding the welfare of danger area, I mean, that's the sort of thing this includes that for sport, including the welfare of danger area, and these elements per se. It helps, but I don't think we can really expand beyond that from the principal element of eminent risk of human life and safety. Right. Um, you're not on the list, but if you want to, you can go next. Oh, okay. I missed you. You're on. You're on the list. Yeah. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, I support this ordinance, and, and I support what we're trying to do with this ordinance. But I do kind of want to stress test this concept a little bit of the wildfire danger area. Is there anyone here from the fire department? Anyone here can actually speak to the fire danger? Okay, well, I'm gonna pretend like you're the fire marshal, Becky, okay? So, 
Yeah, and I think I, I've been designated as kind of the, the, the person for the administration who has been, we had a large meeting, included the fire marshal and the chief of police to talk about practical concerns related with interpretation and enforcement, and I'm kind of the, the non-subject matter expert with uh, who's been a part of gathering the information, so I can hopefully answer some of your questions. So here's here's my, my main question. You know, we, I understand you want to establish this process for wildfire danger areas so that you're not designating the whole municipality. But if there's a burn ban in place, can you give me an example of any green space anchorage that wouldn't be a wildfire danger area? Because when you look at the definition here, wildland urban interface, okay, by Alaskan standards, there is nowhere in this municipality except maybe deep in Chugach State Park that don't constitute urban, uh, uh, wildland urban interface. And if there's a burn ban in place, then by definition, we are worried that any loose ember or spark could set a green space ablaze. So again, where in Anchorage under a burn ban would not be a wildland danger area? Would it just be a matter of we haven't gotten to it yet? We haven't designated it yet. And if you're doing that, then you're just sort of playing whack-a-mole, right? Yeah, so uh, Chair, I, I think that is the crux of the challenge with drafting this ordinance because my understanding from the fire marshal is that you're right, that by the current definition, everywhere in Anchorage would be a wildfire danger area. And if we try to do this everywhere in Anchorage, we run into a number of problems. I think we run into constitutional problems where now we have said, you know, the whole municipality is effectively, uh, has another layer of camping ban on top of it. And then we also run into real pragmatic concerns because we certainly cannot abate the entire municipality with the current budget constraints on 24 hours notice. So you can look at, I mean, you, you could, you're always welcome to consider if we wanted to do that uh, for the whole municipality, what would that cost? I think it's an untenable <coughs> amount for what uh, this municipality has. So I think that my understanding is that, the, and I'll let the sponsors speak to it, but that it seems like the sponsor's intent was to really look more at areas where there was potentially danger for imminent externality, like they're right next to a neighborhood as well, so there would be a burn, so we want to target those areas with some discretion of the fire chief built into the definition um, so that, that we can be more targeted in using these zones. Because again, I think the fire marshal agrees with you that as drafted, <coughs> the whole municipality would be in this zone and it doesn't provide direction for what's supposed to happen. What are what are we really looking to try and do? And I don't think we're really looking to try and just slap another label on the whole municipality and not have targeted priorities. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, just really quick as a sponsor, um, yeah, the intent is to take that back. It was the big S and saving presentation because we got that feedback is to go back and relook at the definition, putting in likely some other factors and proximity issues or dealing with some of those in the uh, well next version. Thank you. <coughs> uh, just some clarification. I'm looking at section three, um, part B. Um, it talks about the fire chief or designee, I assume that the fire marshal has determined an area is a wildfire danger. But then it says a firefighter may declare circumstances um, that obviously puts the municipality into the process then of um, summarily abating um, the issue. So a firefighter, I'm just kind of curious as to why, it, is it any firefighter? Is it someone who happens to be on the scene? Is it anybody who wants to go check out these areas to <coughs> see what's going on in them? Um, who are we talking about here and why? Um, I think the fire the intent here of using a firefighter, well first, the first phrase is there must be a wildfire the new area of the state by fire chief and fire chief that's the thing we want to do now. The intent of the next phrase about firefighter becoming circumstances is to plead um, the fire department things that will crew out by the chief's volunteer fire sports fighters and so forth. If they see circumstances, someone using a stove or a uh, and the stove left unattended, there's some bright spark, uh, or, you know, invested trees. They identify in circumstances. That's really up to the experts. This is mainly to refer to an expert. I use the term firefighter, but in terms of, well, um, a member of the fire department, right? and not just anybody who's on scene. So um, it's got to be 
film with some indoor photography. That was my intent to do some photography. And again, the aspiration being by, you know, print print the black guys to have a better and credits the language there. But it tended to be limited to um, expert in fire, circumstances that are dangerous, and this uh, of fire that they see when they're in the field and books and things else. Just follow up on that? Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess my follow up would be then that is there then a chain of command, so to speak? by which this firefighter firefighter would then jump into this process rather than just uh, saying, okay, now we've got to begin abating this um, because they happen to see it. I, I guess I'm just, I'm still looking at the authority there by which a firefighter might see the situation and then believes that he or she should jump into action um, on this particular site. Okay. This doesn't we really to refer to chain of command and perhaps that's the topic we should talk with the fire about because they understand that crew spawns there is usually one uh, on site fire officer in charge right and so the whole crew perhaps <coughs> there's already clever circumstances to be in the uh, on scene command officer. <coughs> so uh, thank you can you move into that? So I may offer one practical response to you in my in my hat as conveyor of uh, gathered me, uh, administration information. Um, when this, practically speaking, if this were to happen, um, the fire uh, the firefighter who discovers or the the a material that should be abated would not actually abate that material. They would need to contact APD, and APD would come and do that because uh, the firefighters do not, and we need to be very careful to keep them out of the role of enforcement and seizing property. That's not what they do, they're safety officers, and so we would have the police department come, seize the equipment, seize whatever equipment was being seized, and they would store it in accordance with their process and make sure that they process the, uh, uh, whatever they seize properly so we can return it to the individuals. Oh, thank you, I want to add one other thing in drafting this, um, the fire chiefs first fire marshals for six months was this one through in firefighters who respond to the fire bullet and not screwing up the intent here to the responding to these circumstances they say this is dangerous and terrible and that's sort of the true thing for APD to take the fire into this immediately and I also wanted to mention um, and thank you Steve for pointing that out when we were talking earlier about the extended circumstances and uh, baby kick sex immediately that we will address that, but I need to add that if you're in the same section about fire movements, there are circumstances where there wouldn't be an active fire of the area that they could immediately seize the fire movements. We have presumptively um, hazardous or reckless use uh, circumstances listed in subsection C at the top of page 7. So since those, there's no fact of fire of the area. If someone who reckless use of the wildfire ranger area, then fire movements can be taken for safety. So um, I want to I want to move on. I know there's, there's a couple of more comments, and uh, so if we could make those as brief as possible, and then um, if the sponsor, one of the sponsors of this ordinance, could just speak quickly to next steps and timeline, um, and I'd like to make sure that we have enough time for our second item on the agenda. So uh, I think Mr. Cross, your first. Thank you, and just to Ms. Kennedy, to your point, this idea of what's going to happen in that moment, what the firefighters offer to. It's in my understanding of their enforcement, not enforcement, their safety role is they will go in and put out the fire immediately if there is a fire happening or if the tool is in a position that it could cause a problem. And so their first job will be to secure the site from potential eruption of fire. And that won't change in all of this. That's their role. And how then what happens after that? That becomes a question of how the administration rolls for the resources, whether it's the police department or the parks or Never gets delegated to that function. But in an inc incident where there's an actual fire going and there's a high fire danger, they, they actually put the fire out. Right? Mr. Wellington. You know, kind of <coughs> going back to what Forrest said that if we have a burn ban, then really the entire city should be covered by this. And they say, well, we don't have the resources to do, to do that. But, you know, I would imagine the scenario would be, um, you know, if there's a fire, 
then you're going there and you say, okay, and once we put this fire off, they're going to continue to burn. We should take those things. And then if you're uh, doing zone abatement or something, the day you go in to flag it, you can make that the day to trigger. We're going to gather up the fire implements in three days because there's a burn ban. So, because realistically, if there's a burn ban, it should be everywhere. And that MLK fire wasn't what you would say next to a neighborhood, but we evacuated two neighborhoods <coughs> when it was going on. I think my response is that the challenge here is that this, this uh, the zone, the fire, um, wildfire danger area here triggers two things. And I feel like you're talking to the ability to seize uh, fire making implements. And I think that the concern I'm thinking about is the new 24 hour uh, uh, abatement process, which is triggered to the designation. And I think there are different legal concerns in each realm. I think that it probably is more tenable to enforce on a municipality-wide basis the seizure of fire-making implements. That certainly, all this is a resource question, to be frank, the, ch the biggest challenge is that anything flammable has to be stored in a very specific way under a fire code. It's non-negotiable. Our fire code says that Anything if you're storing flammable implements, they have to they have to have a certain thickness of wall between them and any other space. So the amount of storage space you have at the municipality existing for these types of things is relatively low. Uh, you could certainly ask to build more, but that would be I mean, it would come with a price tag. So you have to think about that in terms of if you want to do it, like do this uh, do this on a broad slot basis. Um, but I think legally you could implement this kind of standard. I, Welcome Dean's input as well for that piece of it. I have more questions about doing the changing all abatement to a 24-hour process on a municipal-wide basis on the grounds that the whole municipality has been designated as a wildfire danger area. So I think that might require a different, those should, areas should be more targeted. But um, again, I think here the issue is this one designation triggers two different things in this ordinance which have different legal concerns attached. But I also defer greatly to Dean on this area. Yeah. And I, I really would like to move on if, if we can. So um, is there anything, are you, are you good? We're all good. We'll have more. Okay, time. great. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. So um, um, uh, Chair, Chair Rivera is going to speak to the process quickly in terms of next steps and time timeline, and then we'll move on to item number two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, at our last meeting, we set the public hearing for this item for August 6th. Uh, which is our first meeting in August. So we will have a work session, it appears, on uh, August 2nd. Um, so that's when we will continue delving into this. Um, so if you have any questions, I would just uh, make sure uh, get them to either Meg, uh, myself, uh, or Suzanne, and we can address them on the second. I will have an amendment coming forward, just so and that's on that section three, or the section Right. Thank you. Um, so our, our next item yeah. is, uh, is a discussion on a homeless shelter overflow ordinance. And I know that there was some folks who were invited specifically for this discussion who potentially would be uh, directly impacted by this ordinance in terms of um, offering overflow or emergency shelter. Are those folks in the room? Are there people who would like to come to the table? Um, I, I don't think you're going to be offering. I'm the adjacent property owner. Uh, I I'm getting the overflow now. Uh, I I'm going to offer you Bindle Stick Park a place to put the overflow. I think I'm an important person uh, to be heard. Person, but you're, you're not what, what, what we're talking about right, right, right now. So there that, are, there that's are totally inadequate that and unacceptable. There are there are providers. There are church providers. There are um, others that were asked to to. So um, I just, I'm just wondering if any of those folks are in. The to room. not invite the most effective you is you wrong. You're invited because you're here in the room. You're a part of the conversation. Well, then I'm let me be part of this conversation. Specifically, so I, I don't see anybody any other hands. Yeah. So just to give a little context for this discussion, I think which would be good. We have a we had an overflow shelter or we had an emergency cold weather shelter ordinance in effect and it expired and Mr. Constant and I um, extended that through September 1. What we're hoping to do here um, is to not take away the cold weather provisions as a trigger for overflow shelter, but what we're trying to do is determine if there should be other instances where we use overflow shelter. And what we want to do is have a conversation 
um, led by Mr. Perez Medea. I'm going to describe some ideas that we can take back as we consider the language of the ordinance. We're under a little bit of a time crunch here because this ordinance has to be introduced on the 6th to be heard of August, to be heard at the end of August so that it can be in effect before the other sunsets again on September 1. So I just wanted to provide some context there. And really what we have are um, four areas for discussion. One is um, the, the mechanics, which are pretty much already indicated of how overflow shelter kind of gets, the, the levers get pulled to do it. But then two is what should those levers perhaps be? The who is going to be sheltered and should they be um, different than what we already do? Then the deactivation of the shelter and then whether or not we want to consider overflow shelter um, in private spaces like social organizations and churches at an different acuity level. Right now, it is a very high barrier. You have to have individuals who are sober um, and some other issues. And so we want to have a conversation about whether or not we want to loosen that and what that might look like and if there's any interest. Because the idea is to have more tools in the toolbox, if you will, to meet certain circumstances that may arise. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over. Oh, well, I'm going to let, <coughs> I'm going to let Mr. Constant speak, if that's okay with uh, co-chair, um, because he is on um, working on this as well. And just the, the baseline rationale for the amendment, rather than just the extension, is that the code right now speaks to cold weather shelter, and functionally speaking, we are no longer restricting our overflow or emergency shelter to cold weather. And so my mission here is to ensure that the code and our practice reflects reality instead of perpetuating a process that doesn't match with what we're actually doing. And so some of this is in order to uh, make sure that we're uh, rational. And some of the other parts of it are to contemplate how we can do a better job of what we're doing. Thank you. So the intention here is to have, yes. If I, may, I just wanted to offer a few quick, quick legal clarifications just to make sure that that's clear. So the current code, Title 16, 120, <laughs> provides that automatically at, when the temperature drops below a certain level, 45 degrees, and it's defined where that temperature is measured, it triggers the ability to use spaces, uh, certain spaces in the community for sheltering, for cold weather sheltering. Those include churches, but only for families and it includes social service organizations that go through a process with the health department to become able to do this. In 20, since 2017, we have been using those shelters year round, not just when it is above, below 45 degrees because the assembly passed a series of ordinances suspending the like, trigger to get us back out of that role, acknowledging the extreme lack of shelter beds in the community and among other things, our inability to abate homeless camps if we have nowhere for anyone to go. Um, and so what this, what I understand this, this, the discussion is about is to try and codify a standard for that. So it's not simply, oh gosh, we got to the end of the last ordinance, we need more beds, but to say, this is how we reach the decision as an administration, the health, the health department, how the assembly it figures out when, what triggers that, because realistically speaking, it needs to be triggered at, or we'd like it to be triggered, not simply at that 45 degree threshold, but potentially at other thresholds which could be written into Title 16. Right, and that's that's my understanding as well, is that, is that, um, that, that those, those buildings, those organizations, those services that aren't necessarily designated as shell shelters, that, that that becomes activated and they become a place for people to stay. And what activates that? Um, um, you know, whether that is a, a weather, whether that is a, a need for shell, shell, shelter beds, um, and then what, what on the other side, what deactivates that. Um, and, and I think within that, the, the other conversation that we're, we're trying to have is um, what, are the, what are the standards or the requirements that we have for those organizations that operate that overflow or that emergency um, space? Um, and so that's the conversation we want to have is what, you know, because the intention really is um, to ensure that when there is a need, we have space for people to be. Um, so with that, I think just, I, I'd like to just open it up to this, 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 this group. I think you have a system con context here. Are there, are there thoughts about what should trigger that change? Yes. Thank you. Um, Municipal attorney suggested one that's important for us to contemplate, and that is when we reach the finish mark of capacity at our current 
called standard shelter shelter beds. And so when the homeless <coughs> But when the bed counts hit a certain threshold, then we have to determine what that is, 80% or 90% or wherever that number is over a certain amount of time, five days, 10 days, I don't know. That is when we trigger the capacity of our overflow or emergency shelter. That would be one area. One uh, could be, or we've discussed the possibility of the mayor making a declaration of an emergency or the assembly doing the same. It could be in either house, but that, that declaration is made as the other I'm sure there are a number of other ideas about when that's important. So those are two of the ones that we've discussed. Yeah. And, I, and I know that there are some folks in the room. I, Dave is here, Dave Pepper is here, and, and, and Jazz and I, and I saw Lisa as well. I mean, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about this as well in terms of what 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 should trigger this this change and, 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 and your thoughts about how this is different from what we were doing before um, in terms of creating a space um, when there is a need. Um, so if, if any of you are interested in coming forward and speaking, I'd love, love to make sure that your voice is heard as well. Definitely. There's a mic for it right over here. Yes. You actually look sad. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for having this important conversation. Um, I am still getting up to speed on the implications of our state budget, but I think that your bullet point three um, excuse me, too, about capacity and bed counts is incredibly critical as we better understand how our capacity will be reduced locally. Um, and I think our earlier conversation today about the fires, anytime that there's some sort of public safety challenge that might impact a person's ability to live safely um, outside of traditional shelter, I think it's really important that we consider that as a trigger. Uh, for example, if we have another summer like this summer, um, or even uh, a late fall where people are unable to light fires outside but the temperature at night is dropping, um, we really do need to consider those nuances and implications. Um, again, this is just an off-the-cuff quick reaction. I would certainly turn it over to um, some of our, our shelter folks in the audience who have much more insight. Thanks. Social Services. We operate Brother Francis Shelter, which is an emergency shelter all year round. And it's always an emergency, and we're always open. Um, so I think it's, um, I would say things to consider are that we see the numbers increase when it's wet. And there's a big increase, and, and we can predict it. We see that, and all of us who operate shelter see that. So and I don't know how to put that into an ordinance, but I'm telling you that that is a time when when our, our numbers go close, go up. And I just want to also say that um, this is a really important conversation right now, and I think it would be very important to consider the fact that the state budget cuts have real implications. I board met on Monday, and we're moving forward with a reduction in services. So we can talk more about that, I can talk more about that to all of you at another time, but I think those are the kinds of things that should be taken into consideration with this ordinance, because there's going to be more big changes. Yes. So, <clears throat> we've led to a good point here, it's that we should always have them open when it's cold, when it's wet, or when it's dry. <laughs> So pretty much any time. So what is the limit if um, an organization, Faith Group or some, has it in their ministry or role to just be open to this thing and just say, yeah, you, you, it's up to you. If you meet certain criteria, you can be open. It's up to you. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the conversation we have is when do you deactivate it? Um, you know, we've entitled this more like overflow shelter. We've been kind of going back and forth. We understand what um, Brother Francis says, it's always an emergency, but we're, for the legal terms and when circumstances apply, we want to be really careful about how we're using the terms, you know, what's an emergency, which we think um, this emergency declaration triggers certain things that, you know, that sets off a whole other path. So here we're talking about overflow. So we do need to talk about when deactivation or when review for deactivation should happen. Or scratch everything out on there, just but always. And if a group wants to do it, <coughs> And they meet some criteria, they can do it. So one of the ideas is to not have an act activation or deactivation, but just, uh, just allow it. Yeah, I think you probably need some criteria. 
if we do a conditional use, but once they have it, they have it. It's up for them. Okay. Justin, you, you, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I think it would um, be very wise for the assembly committee to consider uh, what you were saying, um, particularly as it relates to different subpopulations. Um, so while the churches and the faith communities in our community, and, and Mr. Kuiper can speak to this at length, have done a tremendous job for a long period of time helping out in the winter months, um, we also can't compare, and I'm talking about humans, so I hate to say this, but we can't compare one individual's needs to another. Um, the shelters that will be reducing capacity in the next month, I would imagine, are the shelters that take folks who are struggling with tremendous mental health and sometimes physical health challenges. Uh, not necessarily individuals who I would place in a church to sleep at night on a volunteer basis with volunteers who tend to be elderly retirees. Um, so we have to be really, really thoughtful. Um, one of my staff members just shared that our analysis of the budget cuts also indicate that many of the folks we expect to enter into homelessness uh, as these cuts are enacted tend to be the elders, folks who have guardian ad litems, folks who have uh, special disabilities that require special attention. And again, I don't know if those needs could be best met by the faith community. So I, I appreciate the complexities, but I think as we unwind um, a potential conversation about having an increased capacity that could be triggered all year round, we might just want to be thoughtful about increased capacity for who where, uh, and, and making sure that we don't create <coughs> additional challenges for uh, people that are just trying to help out. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I, I, I think I agree with what Mr. Weddleton stated, although I believe there is an administrative and sort of budgetary implication to what you're describing. I could be mistaken. I bet you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think we provide at least some support for these organizations when we open them. And so that's why we don't keep them all open all the time, or one of the reasons why. Um, of the criteria that we have talked about, to me, the one makes the most sense is the capacity bed count. Because then you're not worried about is it hot, is it cold. We don't know what's or we don't know what's driving people into into the shelter. It might be there's a serial killer that's on the trail system. You know, there are things like that we can't anticipate, um, but we can clearly measure what our bed count is and what the capacity is. And if we are almost always at 80 or 90 percent capacity, then we'll functionally be doing what you're describing, Mr. Weddleman. Um, but hopefully someday we'll get to a point where we will be below that number. Uh, but again, to me, the, the easiest to quantify and the one that makes the most sense of the criteria we have there is using capacity and bed counts. Uh, if I might respond to that, I did uh, have occasion to visit with Natasha Pineda, the director of the health department, who can't be here today and sends her apologies, um, but to ask her for some questions about the financial impact of this and or of, of various iterations of this kind of ordinance. And she did say that there, it isn't without cost for her department because if for exactly the reason you pinpoint. She said specifically that churches who go through, who participate in this program require support because generally what they're doing is outside of their normal wheelhouse. And again, per the current code, I think it's important to realize churches are only authorized to house families who are not under the influence of any substance. So it goes to this point of making sure they're dealing with a population they're qualified to deal with. Um, but they still do require more support from the health department. She said uh, that the um, social service facilities who are eligible for this, who are eligible to house individuals of any kind, um, generally have, this is within the realm of, of services that they, or akin to services they normally provide, and they thus require less support. But your point is, is apt. It isn't without cost to do this for the health department. So depending on where you come down on this, uh, Natasha will put together some some estimates. I think I have Wisconsin next. Yeah, as to your point, it's working. Thanks, uh, John. To your point about uh, what about making this all the time? Uh, I think there's some reason to argue that that's a good idea in some circumstances, but maybe not too broadly at first. And I think it creates implications for a rims of the economic development, community economic development on this time for one. Because what we would be doing effectively, whether or not we're changing the underlying rules for what zones you can do these things in, is we're basically putting it anywhere because the church can open anywhere. And um, with that in mind, you know, we already have some organizations that are kitchens that are now quasi shelter, you know, they're really shelter that are trying to stop other businesses and other operations in our commercial districts and in residential areas. This could become a real challenge. And so I think we separate the idea of what we need to do by August 1st, or August 30th, and then if we 
want to move towards the idea of creating some of these uses that are perpetual, that should be a more thoughtful and in-depth conversation that involves the planning and zoning commission. I, I just, uh, for Becky, can you um, detail some of what the um, health department does? You say there's some cost, do they send social workers out or they give them cash? Uh, and admittedly, I'm going to, again, relay uh, perhaps imperfect information. My understanding from Natasha is that they sometimes have some concerns about how to meet the standards they're supposed to meet as a shelter, so we send staff out <coughs> to help them. But I don't know, Nancy, if you know more than... Safe tech has been doing this the longest. Okay. <laughs> I really tried to dodge the invites in the table. Uh. <laughs> um, so it's been my... My name is Dave Piper, to, to chair thank you for the opportunity. Um, for the last um, number of years, uh, there have been a growing number of churches that have um, uh, made their facilities and their volunteers available to house families when there was no other safe place for them to stay during the winter months. Uh, the health department um, has assisted us in um, uh, helping us uh, keep track of the, uh, the uh, verifications uh, and biannual certifications of each of the churches that provides uh, that kind of emergency cold weather shelter and, um, and has also in the last couple of years um, helped us uh, attempt to negotiate uh, with the Anchorage Fire Department on uh, the changes in the ordinance that we experienced uh, reducing the number of families that could stay in a church in it on any one night. So currently, um, currently any new church that uh, makes application to be uh, emergency cold weather shelter is limited to housing 20 people um, at a, on an evening. Many of the churches, and it needs to be sprinklered. So um, the, re the current requirement is sprinkler and 20 capacity. Um, we have churches who have much more capacity for space. According to the um, space required for sleeping for, for folks. And we, um, and we have churches that have considered um, providing shelter that are not sprinklered that, um, because they are not sprinklered will not be able to. So, um, but, the, but the health department has been very helpful in, in uh, helping us navigate the system and in uh, and, and that kind of support to our churches. So that's the extent of the support from the health department. Can you speak about the policies and procedures and the development that was required when the churches came on? Um, as my memory serves me, it's been a while, huh, Nancy? <laughs> I know, but we're talking about onboarding new churches and yeah. a, a new maybe population. Mm -hmm. you so you're talking about the requirements, the, 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 the standards policies and this right. operating procedures. So this was a um, there was a uh, a realization that there was not a safe place for every family that might need a safe place to sleep. Um, when the other shelters, when the uh, McKennell House and Clare House uh, were full. And, um, and so the, uh, for a couple of years, uh, a few churches uh, helped uh, uh, sponsor families in hotels. And then uh, we worked together with United Way and, and several others at uh, providing case management follow-up with those families. And then uh, we started to have conversations with, um, at the time with Daryl Hess uh, to um, approach the assembly for an opportunity for churches to serve as emergency uh, cold weather shelters. And so that's, that's the direction that went. So the, the assembly um, passed, or passed the ordinance um, to fit the, the need of the community and to make it possible for the churches to, to then serve uh, as emergency uh, cold weather shelters at the threshold. It started at uh, 17 degrees and then moved to 32 degrees and then now at the 45 degree threshold. So there was a recognition that uh, that 45 degrees was still too cold for to ask a family to sleep in an unsafe place outside. 
And, and just uh, no, noting time, I want to make sure that we're, we, we, we get as much feedback as we can on sort of helping us to develop this ordinance. Dave, just any thoughts that you have from the, from the organizations that you're involved with on how it should be act activated, how it should be deactivated, um, and what, what, what are your thoughts just in terms of uh, what are some of the sort of standards that are that, are, that you think are, are important to be in this ordinance? Could you also identify what organization you are working with? Our the organization I work with? Yeah, or who you're here on behalf of. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a really interesting thing. The, the, there's a, these are nine churches that, um, that volunteer to do this, and I happen to be the guy that's been around with them and have to get to coordinate their efforts. Um, my employer is Christian Health Associates, but it, it's, it's kind of outside my official duty area. Um, uh, so the question is really about activating, deactivating, you know, and then what are, what are some of the, you know, in terms of what what are the standards that, that need, 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 need to be met? Because the balance is how we are effectively overseeing these to ensure that they're safe and they're responsibly managed, but that there's not, standards aren't so high that it makes it difficult or impossible for organizations like, like the ones that you work with and others to actually pr provide this into the service? Well, so um, I think that it's important for, from a safety standpoint to have fire watch uh, for, um, for emergency cold weather shelters. I do not necessarily think it's necessary for the church to be sprinkler to provide that safe space. I think that there, um, that there are capaci different capacities in different facilities, both um, based on personnel available and space available for sleeping, and safe exit should there be an emergency. And so I think those things should be, should be taken into consideration when a, a particular organization, a church or some other organization wants to offer its space and its people as an emergency cold weather or emergency shelter. Um, I don't think, well, I'll just say it. I don't think the current ordinance, the requirements for sprinkler spaces in the limit of 20 um, should be applied across the board. I think there should be some room for understanding of space and availability of uh, personnel to keep people safe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just to the point of the sprinklering, I, I understand that desire to avoid that standard. And every one of my neighbors who are in business, who have a facility, they all say we shouldn't have that requirement. Even the municipality has that requirement if we want to open an overflow shelter. And I think if the point is to provide a safe space, we have a duty to make sure that safe space is safe. So it might be an area we have a conversation about, but I'm going to dig in for you <coughs> on the idea of ensuring that our spaces are equitable to all the rest of the community's requirements. Yes, that is common. Yeah, I, I think <coughs> I agree to a point, but you know, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have um, certain houses right now that are designated as shelters for people experiencing domestic violence, for example. I don't believe they are required to be sprinklered. So, and again, someone can correct me if that's not the case, but I've been to some of these houses with uh, organizations where people are sheltered. But it's always less than 20. So maybe that's the issue. Maybe maybe, the, maybe we have a sprinkler requirement, but it's triggered at some point rather than blanket. Triggered at 20 people or more, for example, or 10 people or more. Because it sounds like right now it's a blanket requirement. Is that the case? With every shelter, regardless of the one, it has to be. So the, the, the churches that have been uh, providing services along the way um, who are not sprinklered, uh, and they were um, they were certified under previous uh, iterations of the ordinance. They've been allowed to continue, but their capacity has been reduced to the 20 that um, that now applies to all churches that provide this emergency shelter. So, if a new church came on and said we can hold 15 people, would they be required to have a sprinkler? Yes. So I think one of the things, and Mr. Costa brought this up earlier, is right now under the emergency cold weather um, ordinance, we have um, churches can provide for families, um, and then we have um, some social services organizations that can do kind of low barrier shelter, and um, we thought maybe there's a <coughs> spectrum there, and so we kind of want to talk about that. Is there areas in between 
depending on the type of service provider or individual, you know, organization wanting to do the overflow shelter work, can we can we create more of a, a spectrum there to cover more of the population? Yeah. So I want to throw that out there so we don't lose track. That's what the who is like. Should we have more categories? Thank you. May I, may I just clarify something? As, as I recall, the original ordinance uh, did not um, only provide churches the uh, opportunity to provide shelter for families, but what we agreed to do was not mix populations. We felt it was best to have families in, in our um, as a, the primary uh, population that we serve, and uh, that if there were that there were other uh, there were other um, ways of providing emergency shelter for individuals a bit more available, but we decided that it was best just to provide a safe, kind of a safe and, and the feeling of secure environment for families who share that kind of family experience uh, to be sheltered in churches. So as I recall, someone may have to look at the ordinance, but I don't think it specifically um, says churches may not shelter individuals. So I don't think that's the case. Um, so there's yeah there's definitely been instances where we have in emergency situations used churches for other populations um, at different times when we've had to close down and Catholic social services used to um, operate the cold weather, emergency cold weather overflow um, in different situations we totally partner with a church but I'll tell you that the way that we op what we did and um, is that we did we did use a triage system so if when we were partnering with the church to um, provide emergency cold weather shelter we would make sure that the people that we sent there were were folks that were going to be well, first of all that with that setting would work for them because the settings different settings work for different people but also recognizing that some of the people that we serve have higher needs and that volunteers in, in churches aren't necessarily trained and have the kind of you know knowledge and support system to be able to provide service for them so we would do that and I would say that internally when we operated cold weather emergency cold weather shelter we did that even internally because we would because we would um, because we knew it was going to be further away than at our main the main at brother Francis shelter where there'd be more staff we made sure that the people that went there were um, uh, maybe less vulnerable, a little lower needs because we recognize that um, it's just further away from sort of the core central service. All right, and in the interest of time, I want to make sure if there's any final comments from uh, members here at the table um, in terms of this, this discussion, activating the who, any other final comments? Yes. Um, I guess just in, in thinking about all the potential <coughs> possibilities, I mean, there are a lot of people in the community that they want to help in some way, shape, or form. And um, one of the things I don't see on the list is actually private homes. And uh, I have a cousin in Colorado, I just found out he's been doing this, he owns a rental property, and uh, when he has vacant uh, apartments, he will use those for um, uh, uh, homeless people on a temporary basis. So anyway, um, I'm sure one of the questions I think that comes along with that, and maybe this is the question that I'd like an answer for, um, in terms of liability, it seems like once we have somebody in the homeless uh, in, the, in, the, in the homeless services process, that the municipality is assuming some sort of responsibility and liability for that for that individual or individuals, and um, so I can see where there's a lot of res uh, restrictions, regulations, things like that that are basically driving a lot of the um, uh, solutions. So um, that might be an issue of uh, liability-wise, but I also believe that maybe that's the question we need to be answering as well. Is what is the municipality's responsibility in this? 
Thanks. And in terms of individuals who have property that are interested in participating, if you get their information from Nancy or Jasmine, there is actually a project that was founded to bring them in and provide supports to those individuals and organizations and companies. I forget the name of the program, but uh, it's the Widener Project. So. And so, Sherry, if you'd like to make a comment, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap up our meeting. Yeah. And then, I'm sorry, there was one other question. Yeah. Okay. Jasmine, uh, if you want to go ahead and speak first, okay. to, to yeah, speak um, I'm Sherry Laurie from Downtown Hope Center. Um, we have been running, we well, started off as an overflow shelter from Brother Francis in 2015. So we're now in our fourth year, continuously, 365 days a year, 24 7, basically running an a overflow shelter. We've been under that status. Um, at this point, we're at 50 women pretty much every night. And they're what we have done has become very successful. It's given these women a safe place. And at this point right now, we have 16 women in our shelter that are actually employed. And they continue. They're getting healthier all the time. So um, I guess my ask is, I really like Mr. Lewitson's idea of not putting a restriction on it. If we were to shut our shelter down on a, a, you know, a deactivating basis, it would destroy so many women's lives that are actually coming out of their condition and getting back into society. So I would just plead, please, please, um, perhaps make exceptions in certain places. But our shelter has been very successful. There's a lot of people here, I think, that have seen that. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you for coming. Just a few additional considerations for your list, if you will. Uh, one is location, that we know that many of our clients, particularly as we look at a significant increase in people with disabilities and the elderly, uh, needing shelter services, have a very hard time, particularly in the winter, getting anywhere. And so um, right now, the reality we face with the existing budget uh, prior to cuts is um, in the winter, it's very hard to help folks understand where they should go and how they can get there. Um, and so we often have people in wheelchairs shuffling from shelter to shelter. If we're gonna design a better future, or even um, a future that is going to meet the needs of people with um, challenging circumstances, I think considering location and the organization of how we communicate with those experiencing homelessness as to where they need to go or where they can provide safe space <coughs> uh, would be a very helpful consideration. Wonderful. Well, I am going to just make a couple of uh, closing comments, and then we're going to end at our meeting today. Um, I, I did, for those of you that came in after my opening comments, I wanted to make sure that you knew that, that um, um, we are we are working with uh, with Ang Anchored Home and, and all the partners that are involved to, to try to create um, what I would consider to be a better space for public discussion on homelessness. And, um, and so we invite all of you and encourage others to come um, on August 27th from 5.30 to 7.30 at the LUSAC Library, um, where there will be a space and a time to have a robust conversation about homelessness in general. Um, in these meetings, we, um, to, to the degree that we can, we're gonna try to uh, create a little, little bit of space for comment, but most of our time is really gonna be spent on working on potential ordinances. So I wanna thank everybody for coming today. And um, with that being said, uh, meeting adjourned.